In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the issues and solutions that come with trying to estimate uh, the angle of a real body with an accelerometer and a gyroscope. This is the first problem that you're going to come across when you start to try to balance your MIP. The issue is we have a MIP which is going to be sitting upright and we're not going to be able to measure the exact angle of the body using just an accelerometer. Now, you may have heard of an inclinometer, which is exactly what we're going to be looking at here. And what that is, is it's the combination of two accelerometers, one facing normally perpendicular to the gravity vector, and another pointing parallel to the gravity vector. This shows up as the Z direction and the Y direction on your MIP. Now, if you take a careful look at the front of your BeagleBone Blue or your robotics cape, you will see an XYZ coordinate system printed in the silk screen of the PCB. Now, you will see that the Z direction is going to be pointing straight out of the PCB and the Y direction is going to be pointing straight up out of the PCB. Now, these accelerometers are going to measure a positive value when the direction of that coordinate system is pointing opposite to gravity because it's measuring acceleration, not the force induced by gravity. And so in this scenario, when the MIP is sitting completely upright, we are going to have the Y direction pointing straight up and that's going to measure a positive 9.81 meters per second squared. As the MIP tips forward slightly, the Z direction is going to start pointing downward. And so that's going to measure a increasingly negative number. Now from these two values, we can estimate what the angle of the stationary MIP is by taking the inverse tangent of these two numbers. Now, because this is a ratio, it doesn't actually matter which units you use, whether it's meters per second squared or G or even raw ADC numbers that come out of the sensor. So you don't have to worry too much about what your full scale range is set to on the accelerometer since you're simply taking a ratio of the two. Now, this will give us a fantastic estimate at steady state. However, you will start to notice a problem when the MIP starts driving forward and back because we are inducing unwanted noise and acceleration in both of these axes, particularly the Z direction. Therefore, we can say that this estimate of the uh, angle based on the accelerometer is extremely good at low frequencies, but not so good at high frequencies where motion and noise start to overcome the steady state value. Now, luckily, there is a second method by which we can measure this angle, which is by using the gyroscope. Now, the same inertial measurement unit inside of your uh, MIP has three uh, gyroscopes, one of which is pointing in the X direction straight back out to you if you are looking at the left side of the MIP. So this is drawn just up here and is orthogonal to both the X and Z directions. And it follows the right hand rule, which means that the gyroscope is going to measure a positive angular velocity when rotating this way about its axis. Since that aligns with how we are describing the direction of the theta angle of the MIP body, we can simply integrate that value over time in order to get a second estimate for theta, which we'll call theta g, to complement theta a, which we derive from the accelerometer. Now, the issue with this is that now we have drift due to the gyro. The gyroscope is surprisingly accurate across all frequencies, except that it typically has a steady state error by which it thinks that it is constantly moving very, very slowly. And it's very hard to correct for this uh, through generic uh, calibration techniques because as the sensor warms up or cools down moving from one room to another or simply after being turned on for a long period of time that steady state error actually changes 
And so we have to have a more dynamic and real-time way of correcting for that steady state error as opposed to simply calibrating it continuously throughout use. So what we can do is somehow combine the high frequency accuracy of theta g with the low frequency accuracy of theta a and then between the two of them actually find a much better estimate for the angle of your theta. Good enough that we can uh, actually close a feedback loop around this angle and balance the map. Now, in practice, you're going to be implementing uh, these two in software. Uh, the inverse tangent is quite easily implemented with any number of math libraries. Uh, I would suggest looking at the A102 function uh, in the standard C library. Uh, for integrating the gyroscope value, instead you can simply use uh, simple Euler integration by adding to an accumulator GK uh, the current rate of rotation times your time step and then accumulating that over time to obtain your current theta estimate. Now, we mentioned that we were going to combine these two, and we're going to do that with a pair of filters, and we will call these complementary filters. I mentioned that the gyroscope is particularly good at high frequencies, and so let's start with this one. We're going to run the integral of the gyroscope value through a high-pass filter. Now, here we have the Laplace transfer function of a simple first-order high-pass filter with a crossover frequency of omega c. Now, this is a very straightforward transfer function, and we will look at how we implement that in discrete time in the next video. Uh, but for now, I want you just to observe how these two filters behave in the frequency domain. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is try and now make a filter to go alongside the accelerometer data which complements the gyroscope data. So we've started with our high pass filter s over s plus omega c and we're going to calculate the equivalent low pass filter by taking 1 minus the high pass filter. After you calculate this, you will see omega c over s plus omega c is the complement to the high pass filter that we started with. Now, what this means in practice is that if we plot both of these uh, on a Bode magnitude plot together, we will see some curious things arise. So, first, let's just look at magnitude, and we will start with our most useful magnitude, which is 1. We'll say this is a log-log plot with our crossover frequency omega c sitting here and that low pass filter is going to look very much like this where the gain is 1 for low frequencies and then it starts to die off at higher frequencies with a slope of 1 on our log-log plot. Now at this cutoff frequency we are going to have a gain of 1 half. If we now plot our uh, high pass filter alongside this, something very curious will occur. We will see that at high frequencies it will level out, and at low frequencies we will die off at the exact same slope of 1. And it will also have the same gain of 1 half at the cutoff frequency. Now it's a little bit difficult to see on a log-log plot, but these two gains actually sum to 1 across all frequencies when you run the same information through both filters and then sum the result of the two filters. Now this can be seen analytically by simply adding the transfer functions together and seeing that the sum of the transfer functions is 1. But it's helpful to see the Bode plot because here we can get a sense for how much we are favoring one filter over the other by looking at the amount of area under each of these curves. By shifting the crossover frequency up into a higher frequency area, we are removing the area underneath the high pass filter and therefore removing the range of frequencies over which we trust the gyroscope and instead increasing the number of frequencies at which we trust the accelerometer. 
So we have a design decision to make, which is to shuffle omega C up and down across the frequency range in order to favor one sensor over the other. Now this is a design decision where you will have to trade off uh, the settling time of the filter and the estimate versus the uh, responsiveness. So for this particular application, I would like to say that you can trust the sensors as far as high frequency noise is concerned and you can pretty much trust the gyroscope over most frequencies. The accelerometer is really only there to correct for the steady state drift of the gyroscope. So a good starting point may be to use uh, a time constant of about two seconds. Now we can relate the time constant to the cutoff frequency by simply taking the inverse of one or the other. And then we understand that the time constant is the time it takes for one of these filters to rise up or settle to 63.5% of what its final value is. Now this is perhaps easier to think of when making that design decision than thinking of a cutoff frequency in radians per second. So I would suggest starting with a time constant of about two seconds and then shifting it up and down by half an order of magnitude or maybe even a full order of magnitude to see how the filter behaves once you have this implemented in software. This will really give you more of an intuition as to how complementary filters work and what's best for the feedback control of your MIP.